One of the curious facts that emerges from the study of the uh, history of acting is the earnestness with which the famous actors and indeed the less well-known actors have sought to be natural in the way they've acted, to hold the mirror up to nature in what they had to do. But you place against this fact our awareness of how stilted and how artificial, how affected they seem to have been as we study the criticism uh, of their periods and the records that they have left us. In fact, uh, one is faced with a paradox of how these others can at one at the same time seek to be natural and uh, still appear to be so affected and artificial and full of bombast and rhetoric. The resolution to this uh, paradox is clearly that these actors did not seek some eternal value in nature which they sought to imitate, but were merely reproducing the fashions and values of their own time so that audiences who saw these actors were aware that the behavior and manner on the stage was a behavior and manner consistent with the fashionable conventions of their own times. Now, to illustrate this point, I have selected uh, a speech from Shakespeare's Hamlet, the famous soliloquy, to be or not to be. And I'm going to treat this soliloquy in seven different parodies uh, throughout the history of acting, beginning naturally with the Elizabethan period. Now, I remind you that these are parodies. No actor, living or dead, would be caught doing what I shall do this evening, I can assure you. But beneath these parody treatments, there lies, in each instance, a grain or two of truth that will illustrate the styles that were consistent with the periods I've chosen. Now, the first one is, quite naturally, the Elizabethan period. And I've selected Edward Allen, the great rival of the Shakespeare Company, who worked with the Admiral's men, because we know a little more about Edward Allen than we do about uh, many of the other Elizabethan actors, although he was typical of the form and style that is consistent with our knowledge of Elizabethan acting. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Shakespeare himself has left a few comments about Edward Allen. Actually, in uh, Hamlet himself, the speech to the players says, Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags to split the ears, of the groundlings. And later Hamlet says in the same context, Oh, there be players that I have seen play and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, and this is clearly Edward Allen, that having neither the accent of Christians nor the gait of Christian, pagan nor man, have so strutted and bellowed that I had thought some of nature's journeymen had made them and not made them well, they imitated humanity so abominably. Now, Edward Allen was a man who strutted and bellowed and acted in all of the peculiar fashions that are, uh, we generally accept uh, on the Elizabethan stage. He used the stretch foot, which is a large stance, followed by the wind-up before the great speeches are delivered. He strutted and he bellowed and he ranted and was a typical Marlowe actor. Remember, he never played Shakespeare, never did the scene from Hamlet that I'm going to do. Now, you must visualize a large projecting stage coming out into the pit of an Elizabethan playhouse, covered with straw, the men and women standing around in the pit, the orange girls selling their wares, ladies of the evening making rendezvous, business transactions being conducted, and a tumult and an excitement and vigor in this theater, which is unlike the quietism of our own contemporary playhouse. You must imagine that this actor is working against the sound and fury of an audience which pays sometimes very close attention and other times pays little attention. In fact, along this projected stage, there were frequently people seated, the more expensive kind of patron, who uh, frequently would step up and read parts um, if he felt like it and correct the actor in his manuscript. And to these patrons, the actors sometimes made special condescensions. Now, if you can imagine that Edward Allen was ever playing a Shakespearean play, and can picture his doing the to be or not to be speech from Hamlet, this might have been something uh, like it. To be or not to be? <laughs> that is the question. And whether it is nobler the mind to suffer the stings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take on the stretched foot against a sea of troubles and by opposing end. Hello, hello, Sir Phil, how are you, sir? To die, to sleep no more. 
And by your sleep to say we end. This is the strut. The heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is there too. <laughs> That's a consummation. Devoutly to me wish to die. To sleep. Now the start. To sleep. Oh, a chance to dream. Boy, oh, there's the rope. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us Oh, I ought to tell you about the claptrap. I just did one then. The claptrap is a theatrical phrase, although we use it now to describe contentious rubbish. It actually emerges from the theater where an actor or a scene designer developed a certain kind of situation in which the audience was obliged to applaud when they saw it. When the scene goes up on a modern play and you, you feel yourself compelled uh, to applaud, that's a scenic claptrap. When some young actress goes to the door, turns around, and makes a few last words and then leaves and you applaud, that's claptrap. And every actor throughout the history of the theater has developed his own means of claptrap. And when I just stopped a moment before I said, give us pause, that might have been an Elizabethan claptrap. Now you move from the Elizabethan period to another great era of English acting, the 18th century, when David Garrick, during the last 25 years of that century, uh, held the English stage in the palm of his hand. But no longer in this man's work did declamation roar while passion slept. He was a man who made nature so much a part of his work that critics of his own times were spellbound by the natural quietism of his acting. But remember, he played Hamlet dressed in a white periwig, the jabot, the beautifully embroidered coat, the deep waistcoat, the ruffles coming out of his sleeves, satin trousers, the white stockings, black shoes, and knee breeches. And he played it with a handkerchief and with a cane. There seems to be considerable evidence. This is how David Garrick in 1775 or so might have played this scene from Hamlet. To be or not to be. Mm. That is the question. Get the footwork. That is the question. Whether it is uh, nobler in the mind to um, suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and touch by opposing end them. Mm. To die, to sleep no more. As I might sleep to say, we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Oh dear, it's a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, a chance to dream. Ah, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what the dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Oh, bless him, it was never anything like that, I can assure you. Following the late 18th century, the early 19th century grew up, and the characteristic of restrained classicism took over the English stage. It was assumed then that nature was an ordered and designed affair, and that human behavior should follow nature in imposing an order upon nature. So although to the contemporary audience of John Phillips Kemble in the first 12 years of the 19th century, his was a very natural acting. To us, it has the characteristics of a, a foreign and affected kind of, uh, kind of cadence and gesture. The, um, the nearest I think you can come today to imagining what the classic actor was like is if you hear certain preachers treat uh, <coughs> their ministerial work with that that beautiful classic cadence which goes da di da di da di da di di dum dum da di da di da di da di di dum dum that music is the typical classic cadence and John Phillips Campbell was famous for being able to rise in thirds and descend in fifths and his claptrap was always a falling tone which had magnificent uh, musical quality to it he belonged to a school known as the teapot school because his great contemporary Sarah Siddons always took the position of this sort and uh, John Phillips himself was alleged never to have raised his hands above his, his hips. How this could have been possible, I don't know. But this might be the way John Phillips Campbell treated this scene.
to be or not to be. That is the question. For that is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, down a third, and by opposing, down another third, end them. To die, to sleep no more. These men were great at singing these things. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shock. The flesh is there too. But oh, is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die. This is as violent as he ever got to sleep. To sleep. A chance to dream. Aye, there is the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil? Vocal claptrap must. Give us all. Well, John Phillips Campbell was uh, blown off the stage violently by a remarkable young man of diminutive size, hunched shoulders, a cracked voice, and bandy legs, who belongs to that period of English stage history which we speak of as the Romantic period, where a kind of platonic self-importance in, uh, in acting became the, the, the governing principle, where it was the eternal, internal man that should be speaking, where the, the individual must depend upon his own feelings and inspiration, where allegedly no plan, no order, no restraint was necessary, but simply the individual vigor that could come out of the unique soul. And Edmund Keane, that greatest, I suppose, of all romantic actors, is the man of whom Coleridge said, to see Keen is to read Shakespeare by flashes of lightning. And of whom that other great romantic critic Hazlitt said, Keen's acting is an anarchy of passion. Keen could go from um, a complete scream to a whisper within the syllable of a word. He would go with great rapidity for certain passages, followed by an overwhelming lassitude in which a lethargy would seem to to inform what he did. It has been said that uh, when he played in A New Way to Pay Old Debts, an Elizabethan play in which he played Sir Giles Overreach, the leading lady and four other actors on the stage with him at the time during the performance fainted because of the violence and power of this man's work. Byron records in his diaries that this is a soul unlike any other. And it is a, a matter of record that uh, Brave men wept and women were carried out prostrate during the course of, uh, of Keane's work. Uh, we can see what I'm going to do with that. To be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> Is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. He was great for starts too. Or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end to die. To sleep no more. Like a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation divine to be wished. Isn't this silly? Why am I doing this? To die, to sleep no more, and by sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is there to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep. But just to be, oh, 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 oh. and for us, for in that sleep of death, what, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us the greatest claptrap in the world. And I can wait for three minutes before you say the last word. Torturing people to death. Pause! Then the, the note that follows this is the beginning of a period in which the character actor develops. 
During the late years of the 19th century, dramatists began to write the kind of play in which um, unique and peculiar personalities uh, were cast. No longer simply the noble figure, no longer simply the, uh, the classic restrained individual or even the tempestuous personality such as, um, as Keene's Hamlet, but a, a unique kind of uh, personality began to fill the pages of plays and to appear on the English stage. And one of the greatest of the men who was able to do this so beautifully was Sir Henry Irving, the lessee of the Lyceum Theatre for many years. Sir Henry was a uh, peculiar actor, at least from the records that I have read, in that he had a number of strange vocal treatments which I can't hope to approximate. He had a number of special gesticulations, such as placing his finger against his nose, and he's the man who was able to keep audiences spellbound for seven or eight minutes while he did nothing more than stoop down and tie his shoelace. He was a great man for creating suspense by his vivid starts and movements. But he played Hamlet, as has been said, as a character, no longer the simple personality of the man that we think of as the Dane, but a man now specially gifted with Henry Irving's personality. And this is what Henry Irving might have been like. <clears throat> mm. To be or not to be, hmm? that is the question. The wealth is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of our radius fortune, or to, to take arms against a sea of troubles and uh, by opposing to end them to die to sleep no more and by sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to sounds rather like Lionel Barrymore he's an old character actor too flesh is heir to mm -hmm. It's a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep. Nothing. You just create suspect. To sleep no more. And in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this world for must give us pause. <laughs> well, bless him. He's turning over tonight. In our own century, we went through a period in the 30s when the little man, the man without a job, the man for whom fate was too heavy became the center of our orientation. During the 30s, the little man, as he is far too often and too fatuously called, the man without a job, the man who was a worker, no longer a robber baron, became the man who somehow or other represented the natural forces and the cause of events that we were a part of. And a great English actor came over to this country and played Hamlet rather as though he were the little boy around the corner. And he was a great actor indeed. He's only recently dead. And this is some, somehow my feeling of the way Leslie Howard gave us the feeling that Hamlet was just like one of us, suffering our pains and having our hopes. And this is what Leslie Howard never did, what in my parody he might have done. is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to 
take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing any of them to die and to sleep no more and by sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that rushes air to. It's a consummation devoutly to be wished to die and sleep. To sleep. Oh. Put chance to dream. I dance the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must must give us pause. Shocking, isn't it? Shocking. Do a thing like that to Leslie Howe. I shall do worse. Come down to our own period, and as a man that you can see a great deal of on television, who has a way of taking a Shakespearean play and chopping it up, presenting his audience with a sort of a Elizabethan hamburger. A man of great vitality, great charm, great power, a great voice, beautiful diction. He can be heard in the back of any auditorium. And this is uh, my impression of how this natural actor does the role. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles, and by opposing any of them. We have a double chin, we must be careful about it. To die, to sleep no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Oh, it is a consummation to to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep. Ah, but chance to dream. Aye, there is the rub. The diction is beautiful, but you have a feeling he doesn't quite understand what he's saying. There is the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. And he stays right with the television camera till it fades away. Well, one day, I suspect, in this country, we will have a school of acting known as the Waterfront School of Acting, in which the potato in the mouth treatment of Hamlet will seem to be the most natural thing in the world. And although he has already played in one Shakespearean play, one day Marlon Brando, indeed himself, may undertake to do Hamlet. And I have a feeling that it might go something like this. Uh, uh, oh, to, to be or not to be? It's a question. Well, it is noble in, in the mind to mm, suffer the things now of outrageous fortune or take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them, I guess. Well, I, I won't pursue that any longer. In fact, enough of this nonsense. Before I leave you this evening, perhaps it might interest you to see how these lines might be given in order that the beauty of the poetry of Shakespeare might come most vividly before you. And after these ridiculous parodies, it might give you some pleasure to hear these lines without any further affectation and no more bombast or rhetoric or peculiarity. So if the electricians will turn down the lights, I shall just read these words to you in a way that Shakespeare might have liked to have them read. Although I don't pretend to be a Shakespearean actor, I'm going to take off my tie and open my collar so as to 
advance the romantic effect and give myself as much of a Byronic appearance in doing this as I can. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation, devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, a chance to dream. Aye. There is the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Thank you. Good night.